Welcome to the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. Each week, Matt, Kurt, Jerry, and the occasional special guest explore how the trauma informed paradigm challenges traditional beliefs and approaches concerning a wide variety of areas. This podcast addresses psychological trauma in an educational manner and is not designed to replace mental health treatment. If anything in this podcast makes you feel uncomfortable or anxious, please talk to a mental health professional. Welcome, friends, to episode 60 of the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. I'm Matt. I'm back here with Kurt and Jerry today um, talking about uh, trauma and memories. Um, this probably is a, a topic that we could spend three or four episodes on, but I think you know, just sort of looking at, there's been some stuff in the news lately about this and, and just, you know, the impact that trauma has on memories formed during the traumatic experience and, and also just some research coming out about uh, how sort of memories, even those that aren't traumatic, uh, can't be all that trusted uh, uh, just due to their, their nature. So uh, I titled this one Memories the Way We Were because I remember uh, for me, uh, one of my greatest childhood memories was uh, my dad's team. And this was the year that Hoosiers, the movie came out, which I still argue is the greatest sports movie of all times. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was uh, a basketball coach for a, uh, a Catholic high school that had about 300 kids in it. And it was back when there was single class basketball in Indiana back back when it meant something, as I like to say. And, uh, you know, that we went to uh, basically the final eight. Uh, we were one win away from the final four. And, uh, you know, I, the, the school, the parents and the kids, and this was uh, back in the 80s. So it wasn't when uh, it was easy to make a video. They uh, clipped a whole lot of uh, uh, game film and other film together. And they, that song, The Way We Were, uh, just, you know, everybody in the room was crying at the end of the year kind of banquet. And it always, when I hear that song, it takes me back to my uh, little like fourth grade self running around the floor <laughs> acting crazy after basketball games. So- uh, Were you, were you uh, ever little, Matt? What's that? Were you ever little? Uh, compared to high school kids, I was. <laughs> Relatively speaking, yes. Yeah, and, and definitely emotionally uh, and developmentally, I was. So, uh, uh, so yeah, so I, I had a little bit of fun with my own memories uh, for this episode. But before we get in, uh, like we always do, let's talk about some bright, shiny objects of the week. Um, hey, Jerry, why don't you start us out this week? You know, my bright, shiny object this week was our getting an opportunity to present together. So, um, you know, we went and uh, talked to people who um, are interested in employment. And that is a um, tribute to this issue of having shared language, um, is this ability to go to multiple kind of uh, groups and talk about things that are relevant to them from a perspective of a trauma-informed perspective. So I I think this uh, ability to kind of create shared language across disciplines um, is my bright, shiny object this week. Awesome. Mine too. That was great. That was really (laughs) enjoyable. That was a lot. That was a lot of fun. So, Kurt, I gave Jerry the easy one this week. Uh, anything <laughs> on your end? I mean, related to that, right? I mean, there was. It was really fun to be able to be there with the two of you, and I always enjoy that so much. And then also, you know, thinking about doing the podcast is something that we've kind of done together, and then going to speak at a conference. At least for me, this was my first time doing that with the two of you. Yeah. And one of the really fun things that's different relative to doing this podcast is we got feedback from the audience <laughs> and we actually got to talk to people afterwards and, and I have I have forgotten how enjoyable that is and that was really um that was really fun for me and I connected with people that I hadn't seen with for years and we've you know discovered that we worked at the same places and didn't know it and it, I just had a lot of fun doing that and hearing the the way like you said Jerry that you can have this shared language that that transcends all these different topic areas and different service areas and it was a good example of how i I think what what connects for me on the trauma-informed approach is that 
it's rooted in all the components of the human experience. It's a way for us to understand what happens inside a person and how that helps us to understand what happens outside the person and how the environment interacts with them and how they in turn interact with the environment. So I think it's a nice round way to, to kind of look at all of that together. Um, and and that, I think that's why it transcends all these different areas because it's rooted with in, in, in the human experience and what it is to be a human being. Yeah. I would, uh, yeah, definitely support that. It was a fun time. I'll add a little bit something different here because this will, uh, this episode will come out uh, on Tuesday, which is uh, the midterm elections. And uh, yeah, I, I sit here today. I, I won't tell you what side I'm rooting for, though. I'm sure that's not a uh, hard for all yes. sure, Matt. Yeah, yeah, big secret there. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's just uh, one of the things, you know, I can speak uh, pretty freely, freely in a country, disagree uh, sometimes uh, very passionately with the leaders in our country. And it's, it's always a good reminder when that, and uh, we, I think, are lucky enough to live in a state where they mail us our ballot. Um, you know, as I watch all these lines, my sister had to stand in line in a very cold Indiana day for an hour and a half to vote, uh, which I think there's something really cool about that too, but I'd much rather be inside uh, uh, filling it out. Uh, and, but it, I mean, it just, it, it was really cool that at the end of the day, you get to do something um, about it, even though, again, it's, it's a small, it's a drop in the bucket, but you get to have that drop in the bucket. And uh, we, we might be in the state that I hope this will be my bright, shiny object of the week where we may uh, have an openly gay uh, governor, uh, knock on wood, which, which I think, you know, sometimes, I, you know, it doesn't seem like that's a huge deal anymore. And I think that's a huge deal that it doesn't seem like a huge deal. So, um, yeah, we'll see if that, uh, the elections are my bright, shiny object next week. But uh, uh, really excited uh, that, that I got an opportunity to... Uh, from all the marching and everything else I've done over the last few years and protesting to actually cast that vote. So uh, that felt good for me at least. So uh, let's talk about memories. Uh, you know, Jer Jerry, you might be the, the best one to kind of start us out here along some of the research, but one of the things, you know, that, that I've really uh, been fascinated with, and some of this honestly comes from some of my own experiences as well is you know, the, how trauma gets encoded as a memory. Um, and I think there's a lot of complexity to that. But, you know, I think, and especially, you know, you, you saw this kind of come out during some, some of our political stuff going on is how, how well you, you know, we should take traumatic memories. Um, I, I think we're seeing a lot of this in the criminal justice of eyewitness testimony uh, especially for those who've experienced trauma during that testimony, has been shown to be in some ways uh, very unreliable. Even if folks uh, are just trying to remember something that they were a bystander at with no kind of traumatic response, it's, it's not, uh, memories aren't that reliable. And so, you know, I, I know I can talk a little bit about stress, the hippocampus, cortisol, but, but Jerry, I think you'd probably be a good one to kind of kind of start us out on this of, of sort of that relationship uh, from a biological uh, perspective, neurobiological perspective of uh, how does a traumatic memory might form a little bit differently than, than say just, just a normal a memory of our last birthday or holidays or, or something along those lines? So a couple of thoughts to respond. First one is, um, as a therapist or as a, a service provider, you're not in the business of forensic um, trying to figure out what's true or not, because what you're trying to understand is what's true for this individual and what's true for the individual is impacting their ability to process information in the present, right? So, it, it, it's a very different type of question we're asking as opposed to a courtroom of, uh, you know, is this the truth or is this not the truth? And so this argument about our memory's faults um, really is a forensic question, not a therapeutic question. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the first thing to kind of talk about. 
The next thing I think is important to do is, is to kind of broaden the concept of what a memory is. Memory is the capacity to bring experiences that occurred in the past into the future to determine how you want to respond to the environment in the moment, right? And given that every cell in our body has that ability to actually store information and make different decisions. So our immune system who gets exposed to some type of uh, germ or virus actually changes and responds to that virus differently in the future. Um, that's a body, mem that's a physical memory. And so when we understand that the very nature of our biology is to change and adapt to our experiences, Memories are something that um, really makes sense that there are, they're what happens to us that both is what's real and then our interpretation of what happens that is then brought into the present and guides us in making decisions. That's what, it, what a memory is. So you could have a memory at the level of a muscle. You could have a memory at the, at the any place in your nervous system. And then a memory so that when we think about memories, we often are t thinking about cognitive recall as a memory when memories are so much greater than what we can cognitively recall. That's the first point I wanna make. The second one is what happens with traumatic memories is trauma is being exposed to some type of experience that overwhelms the nervous system's ability to integrate that experience. And when we're, we're presented with some type of high level of stress on our system, we release certain chemicals in our body to be able to effectively respond. One of those things is that we re-release re adrenaline. So adrenaline is gonna actually make us in some ways more effectively ready to respond to the environment, which actually primes the amygdala to be able to, in some ways, encode this experience as an emotional experience, right? At the same time, we're releasing cortisol, and cortisol is neurotoxic when it's in high levels. So they're down-regulating the part of the brain that's going to encode this memory in a contextual way and upregulating the part of the brain that's encoding it in an emotional memory. And so this experience is encoded in our physical body, in our emotional assessment and evaluation of something. And oftentimes, because of the intensity, may not have language, or it may be that our attention is drawn away from that split attention that we're not actually paying attention to the thing that's frightening to us. So how it gets encoded in our verbal memory may be fragmented and in some ways distorted, right? And so when we kind of understand that many of the memories that we're looking at are not accurately a videotape of what actually happened, but it is the body's response to what had happened, what it perceived had happened. And so you have this, in some ways, the body prepares for this experience in the future as if it's occurring again, mm -hmm. right? So a traumatic memory isn't about having a memory actually, it's about re-experiencing that event in the present. Which we would label re-traumatization, correct? Which we would label in some ways a flashback or we would have a, a reliving of it. So yes. when we think about trauma, which is different than having a memory where I could think about, I remember being with you guys last week, mm -hmm. memory is about my body is actually reacting in the moment as it did in the, at the time of the event. 
Yeah, and, and and so so when we 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 talk about you know I think the post traumatic stress disorder responses those things again I think one of the things that that is kind of fascinating for me I'd like to throw this question out to either either one of you because it's something I've been thinking a little bit about is you know before we had this language as uh, you know you guys talked about the shared language that that we were able to establish uh, with, with the folks we worked with uh, this week. You know, one, one of the things that, that uh, I learned, what we said in graduate school is more of these repressed memories. Uh, and, and I just kind of, I, I've been thinking lately because I've been doing some reading on memories and it seems like we've progressed sort of beyond the concept of repressed memories. But, but I think a lot of times what I think I'm, I'm seeing um, from kind of a clinical perspective is a lot of times while the person, Jerry, as you're saying, wouldn't be able to necessarily recall verbally and tell you, kind of describe the videotape of the memory. There, there is still a, whether we call it post-traumatic stress disorder response or whatever kind of label we put on it, there's, there's this really intense response, which I think can leave a lot of people sort of uh, dumbfounded uh, when they don't kind of have uh, the, the why behind that. And I just kind of, I wonder to bring kind of the old and the new together is, uh, I know we spent a lot of time in grad school talking about repressed memories and you, you don't kind of hear that terminology as much anymore, but it seems like it's still there, but, but we're maybe calling it something different and, and just love to get either of yours kind of response to some of these questions floating around in my own head. You know, when, when Jerry's first point about there's a body reaction mm -hmm. that is a component of memory. Now, that would be what we would call implicit versus explicit memory. Something that is explicit is what we give language to. And so an example of that is in the behavioral world, we call that respondent conditioning, classical conditioning. And that's one way that we, we talk about that from a behavioral perspective. And so if I'm over here, um, I've done this in groups before, and it's really a great example. We pick somebody and what, what I do is turn the lights on and off. And when you change the light levels, the pupils dilate reflexively. I'd have to let in more light. If I say, hey, right before I change the light levels and do that repeatedly, it doesn't take very long actually. And pretty soon the pupils start to dilate even if I don't change the light levels in response to the cue, hey, right? Simple classical conditioning. That's memory. And that's a very, the basic component of memory is then that's the body's ability to carry that experience forward in time and have a response to a new type of cue, a new type of event right? that, is a, that is a result of that person's history. One of the fascinating things I think about that, when we think about that as memory, which we're so used to talking about memory in the explicit memory terms of like the example Jerry gave was a great one. I can remember being with you guys last week. Right? That's a, a way that we talk about memory. Now you talk about memory in a way that, let's ask somebody, did your pupils dilate or not? Mm -hmm. When I said, hey, you don't know. Like you have no, like there is no conscious awareness of that event, but it's still memory, right? So that, and that kind of, that kind of learning, that conditioning can happen at an emotional level. So you think about how information is, is we're gathering information as, as an organism, we're looking at all kinds of sensory receptors that we have and the ability to gather all kinds of input from our environment and use that information then to adapt to what is happening and it's going to come along, right? But so much of that information never gets to our frontal cortex, right? It comes in through our skin, through our eyes, through our nose, through our mouth, through all these sensory receptors. And I mean, ask somebody about like, what temperature is it in the room, right? We're not paying attention to that. We don't need to, right? it, it stays at a lower level of the brain until it changes a certain amount and then it gets kicked up to the next level. And so all that information is entering our bodies through these receptors and getting integrated and pumped through basically the spinal cord to the brainstem. The brainstem then is starting to react to that information and sending it up the next level, right? So we may start, we start having regulatory changes well before we have any awareness of that regu regulatory change happening. And then those kinds of memories, that kind of, that kind of learning happens without us having any, any concept of being able to put it into a verbal narrative. Mm -hmm. 
So that question, I mean, you're, you're kind of leading, I think, into this really kind of key question, which is to ask somebody, why did you do that? Yeah. Right? That's a really, really challenging question for people to answer accurately. Yeah. And we're really bad at it. Yeah. Because, we, because of the way that our brain is structured, because of the fact that it doesn't, like all that information doesn't necessarily get into a part of our brain that has language associated with it we're not really good at accurately describing exactly all the events that happened that caused us to engage in some act mm -hmm. or not engage in some act, right? So answering that question, why did you do that? Or why did you not do that? It, it's really the, the, what drives that answer is number one, what we noticed. And number two, what we think that the person that we're talking to will accept as a plausible cause. And those are the two major determinants of how we answer that question. It really isn't tied to what actually happened at all. Yeah. Including the, the answer I got a lot was, I don't know. Yeah, and I'm absolutely, like, absolutely. of course you know. The rules are on the wall. Right. And, right. and yet now I get that, well, working with teenagers sometimes, it might have been a little bit manipulative, but that's a really legitimate answer now that we've, we've we got the science to show it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's probably about as truthful an answer as you can get. I, I think so. I try it with my wife now, but it doesn't carry nearly as far as I give my the, my teenage clients. <laughs> it leads right into your to your first point, Jerry. That there's the forensic nature of that question, and then there's a the therapeutic nature of that question. Right. And, and I think that's a great distinction. So, in regard to your question about repression, is repression probably is a very valid issue, right? Is there some things we know and then we don't want to think about, right? However, when we're talking about trauma, it's, it's more um, in line with what we know about neurobiology, that we're talking about dissociation and disintegration, right? Is that these memories in a healthy, um, safe, kind of responsive brain has a sensation, has an emotion, has a thought and integrates that into making a decision on how to respond to the world. When we're talking about trauma, these processes, these internal systems are disintegrated, right? And so that's why it becomes difficult when you try to take this process into an arena where you're looking for what is the objective truth as opposed to how did this experience impact you and impact your ability in the here in this moment to be able to effectively integrate so you stay here in the moment as opposed to being pulled back into the past right and so that that really is that is in a trauma perspective where this concept of disassociation disconnection, disintegration is, is more talked about than repression and suppression. Yeah, and it, it's, you know, the, the interesting thing, and, you know, again, is somebody's kind of experienced what was once termed uh, a repressed memory, and then when I heard about disassociation kind of helped me with that. But one of the things I, I think I really struggle with, and I love to get, again, this is, I don't want this to turn into a therapy session for Matt per se, but, but, you know, one of the things that, that as someone who had gone through this, one of those really intense experiences that were not, uh, the videotape uh, turned off at some point and I, you know, kind of left years later recalling pieces of it. You know, one of the things that, that I uh, paid a lot of attention to as in my learning experience was kind of the concept that, well, once you're strong enough, once you're resilient enough, this memory will magically pop back into your head. And it was a tough thing for me, and I, I, I really, I think, experienced this in different ways with other people, is, you, you know, it kind of started to just piss me off that I couldn't remember. Like, like I, you know, because it was like hard to form in some ways my narrative around it without all the pieces to the puzzle without the with just chips and like clips instead of the entire entire video and I think that that's in some ways I don't think I'm alone in, in that experience uh you know with what I went through is like there's this mystery there I want to solve the mystery so I can kind of I I think what I was trying to do is tell a 
a coherent story about my experience. And yet, you know, I, I could, I still to this day at 43, haven't recovered those clips. And I think when you, you get into recovered memories, you, that's a whole different podcast. Um, but, but I think it's inter I think it, it does trap people sometimes. And, you know, I, I can't, I can't play the film back to really understand why I'm the way I am. And I, I you know, I just have to find that powerful in my own life and also in, in the work that I've done with folks too. You know, interesting thinking about the, the triune brain model, right? That you can have all three of these levels that affect one another. And so things can go from the bottom to the middle to the top, and then things can go from the middle to the, like, it can all just change from the top to the middle to the bottom. And one of the functions of the prefrontal cortex is anticipation. Mm -hmm. And so we have this urge to be able to put a narrative to things. And when we can't, it's uncomfortable, right? It takes that in one way would take what's happening at the top level of the brain. And it's, it's really leading to a reaction in the middle level of the brain and that feeling of discomfort because we can't anticipate or think here's the narrative to that becomes a, a driver that really gets active activity going uh, within our brain and can certainly lead to all kinds of different behavior, right? That you can kind of see how that would play itself through as we think about one of the functions of affect or emotion is to give us urges to do things and urges to avoid things. And those tie right into like functional behavior assessment and all those kinds of categories of why we kind of do what a lot of the things that we do. There's a really interesting kind of area to be to be thinking about and as I thought about to one of the shifts in the questions that I think is important from a from a therapy standpoint is shifting the question away from why did you do that to what was that like for you and that's such an important shift in question which is something I learned from Jerry right like that's like one of Jerry's go-to questions what was that like for you and get somebody talking about their experience mm -hmm regardless of whether it's, you know, like any kind of value judgment placed on it or any kind of seeking for what's actually objectively true in that question is just tell me about your experience. And let's just talk, let's talk about your experience and what happened in your body then and what was going on in the environment then. You start to be able to have some, some real, I think, meaningful dialogue about that person's experience, mm -hmm. which is different than what happened right? or, or why did that happen or why did that not happen? That's one of those key shifts in asking the right question that, I, that I've seen work really, really well over the years. Yeah. Jerry, what are your thoughts? You know, um, my, my thought is, is that off, as you talk about is I want to get to a narrative. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes treatment approaches think that a narrative is the strategy to resolve some of these issues, right? And in some ways, when we can form a, a, a narrative that works for us, that's the end of treatment, <laughs> right? Not to, right? That's the end of treatment. Whatever the narrative is, well, whatever right? Whatever the narrative is, that allows you to stay in the present, allows you to kind of like um, soothe your reactivity to stimuli, to be able to downregulate hypervigilance and fear reactions to kind of do it. Then. But really what we're kind of talking about is that many of the memories that people have are not encoded in what this, you know, if you wanted to call it explicit memory, which is can be broken up into somatic um, kind of experiences where there's facts and information about what had happened. And then there's episodic, which is autobiographical about how I am in this day. But really, it gets recorded at an emotional experience, and it would get recorded at a procedural mode of behavioral experience, right? And so when you're with an individual, and something happens, and they don't have a cognitive uh, recall of what had happened, really how it's going to be, they're going to be reacting emotionally to what's going on and they're going to have some type of physical gesture or kind of body reaction to what's going on. And so in a trauma in approach is that you could start by asking the question of, tell me about what you remember going on. 
and let's kind of go back and uncover the memories. The research is, has, over the last few years, has not supported that somehow if we just go back and do an archaeological dig into our past, that that helps us. Really what happens is if we can be in, in the moment, in the here and now, observing our own physical and emotional reaction, that engages the top part of our brain. And we have this observing kind of quality. So if you're having some tension and you actually bring your attention to that tension, you're learning how to manage that experience in the here and now, right? And then when I have the ability to, in some ways, be able to tolerate, modulate, and cope with my internal states, my ability to have different types of experience, you and I talked, Matt, about being open and closed systems, mm -hmm. is that when I can, in some ways, be more aware of my internal states, I have the ability to engage in life and have more, in some ways, different kind of feedback into my system that allows me to create different narratives, right? But if my body and my automatic reactions reenact what I'm going to have, then I, in some ways, reinforce a belief, an attitude, and a, in some ways, a perception of myself and others in the world that is built on not what's happening in the moment, but what happened in the past. Yeah. So when, when I'm with someone, and it's really difficult, you know, I, I try to stay present, but, you know, I have a, a, I have a client who, she did some incredible work, but because her experience with males was so invalidating and so um, intrusive, that she could hold me in her mind, but her body went to the past. Mm. And she couldn't actually make good use of it. And so really the solution really was to have to give her the referral to work with a female therapist to help her kind of work through that. So I can have all of these great beliefs and knowledge to do it, but oftentimes our clients' physiological responses Right? I may smile and it reminds them of their perpetrator smile. I may, in some ways, just shake my head in a way to acknowledge where they're at, but that triggers something so that we have to realize that this individual in front of us has to be able at least to keep a part of them in the present with us as they revisit some of this past. Yeah. And the big challenge there, too, is that it goes even back to that question of why do you have that reaction, right? I mean, that would be the natural kind of question you lack, like, why don't you, why do you, why don't you like me? That kind of question, right? Why do you have this reaction to me? And, and that person would not be able to tell you the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Right. And I wouldn't be able to tell you totally what my reactions were, right? I'd have to make up some narrative in my head, but really... What's happening between us is more a right brain, subcortical, nonverbal interactional process that is happening. So a part of our communication is what we're saying. And a large part of it is this nonverbal where I'm triggering her, she's triggering me, I'm going to do it. And really, I, I need not to ask what's, what, what's wrong with you to do it. What I have to kind of figure out is, First, how do I regulate my internal states, right? How do I become more aware of my procedural memories to being triggered? So in therapy, really, it's a interactional process. It's not a, you know, a one directional process. So in this situation, being with an individual whose nervous system is dysregulated by something I'm doing, I have to be very, very attuned and aware of how I might be in some ways non-verbally resonating with that state. Yeah. Well, well, and I think it brings up what one of the areas that, that I think so much about. And I think, 
you know, working with schools, uh, you know, and medical providers really, uh, I, I think that it puts all this somewhat right in the forefront. Because if you, you know, we, we talk about a lot of times that those implicit memories also, you know, what we've seen in the research come out, and I, I've, I think we've all probably witnessed this firsthand, is sometimes those memories are stored in the body as well. And so if an assault started with somebody grabbing my shoulder, um, a friend might just gently put their hand on, on your shoulder and all of a sudden, you know, you, that memory comes back, uh, whether you know why or not. And I think, you, you know, Jerry, you said something to me early on in my learning too, that, that makes me think about, you know, kind of how we set physicians up sometimes. I, I think all of us in the helping professions are sometimes, uh, whether, you know, we, we have any control over or not set up to, to trigger this thing, but trying to think about uh, when we were working on creating safe school environments for traumatized children and, and thinking, helping me think about their experiences. Like, w what if you were in school and there was a tiger walking up and down that, that classroom? How, how easy would it be for you to learn? And, and the tricky thing is, okay, that's terrible. Um, but what is that kid's tiger versus the kid sitting next to them? And, and I think about, you know, medical services where we're, we're laying hands on folks' bodies, including highly sensitive areas, um, <laughs> And how we, you know, in some ways our, our traditional approaches, like having a physician or a nurse do a physical hands-on examination with only maybe a couple minutes to build any kind of trust, rapport, and safety, uh, you know, sets it up. So one of the things I'm really fascinated with, and I know but all three of us think a lot about setting up uh, healing environments, safe environments, environments that help people regulate enough to consider and change behaviors. Um, you know, know, what are some things that you guys think about is helping to, as best as possible, uh, minimize potential re-traumatization triggers, knowing that, you know, like you said, Jerry, it might be that I'm a man, uh, or that you're a woman, or that I'm tall, um, you're short, you know, all these things can be potentially re-traumatizing, but what are some of the ways we might be able to at least minimize that in, in the environments we, we work in for our and, folks? You know, and just One of the things that I think, whether it's physician or whether it's in a residential treatment or whether you're in an outpatient or whether you're a teacher, is that if the individual has had experience where they have not been seen, where they have been hurt, where they have been um, violated in some form or fashion, psychoeducation is a really important part of the process, right? And, and so helping them to kind of normalize that they haven't been either cared for or responded to in a way that has made them feel safe and have a sense of worth, right? And that their body is naturally going to be reacting differently because of those experiences. And because I am not aware of what we assume, I know, but I am not aware of what makes you feel safe and what makes you feel threatened. So that I really want you to be aware that you have to help me as we move along, as I interact. And so if I have to actually um, give you an exam, it's okay for you to tell me that I'm uncomfortable with this. It's okay for you to say, you know, I, it's moving too fast or it's moving too slow. It's kind of do it. So I, this concept of empowerment and voice and choice and kind of process goes right down to the fact that I really don't know what I'm going to do in this moment that I'm with you that may, might be interpreted by you as threatening. So I begin that dialogue very early in the process that I may even give you some kind of nonverbal signal that you could tell me if things are getting too much or right, but that this is a process where you have to tell me what works for you. Not, 
I assume I know what worked for you. I, you know, I heard Ron Siegel talk and he, he talked about residential treatments, right? Most people in this field, somewhere or another, worked in a residential treatment. And they spend, in residential treatment, they spend all this time training staff how to restrain people in a way that doesn't hurt them. Well, there is no way to restrain people in a way that doesn't hurt them, right? So you could do all by the Cornell or whatever, whatever you're gonna do, being held down against your will is a painful, humiliating experience, right? And so you may have to do that, but there's no way that we can engage in that type of interaction without it being somewhat impactful to the individual and kind of do it, right? So we, so the same way is I may think that I'm being open and curious and I'm being empathetic to you, but for you, when I'm empathetic to you, that triggers your, your attachment needs and my empathy actually makes you feel even more uncomfortable and you want to get the hell out of there, right? Or because I'm empathetic, you now open up and tell me your story and it's too much for me, but I leave, right? So the, all the things that we learned about as being good therapists, if I don't really ask the person or become aware of the person that's sitting in front of me, may actually trigger a traumatic experience and be, so I, 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 you know, I, I went to a treatment center this week and they go, give four praises for every negative interaction. Well, that's a great model, but it really doesn't say what does praise mean to the person that I'm in front of them, yeah. right? So how do I, in a relationship, begin to have this person realize that who they are what they feel, what they're sensing is important to me. That's the most important part of the interaction. So you're going to teach me how best to care for you, right? As opposed to me coming in with an already formulated belief about smiling or empathy or, you know, or being cognitive, uh, right? It's like, We had Jerry Freeze here, uh, so I'll, I'll try to finish his uh, statement. Uh, but, but Kurt, I mean, I, you know, what, what he said to me was, you know, incredibly powerful. Uh, I love, we get to see Jerry's face frozen, but uh, uh, you don't see it if you're on the video. Uh, but, but, but I think about his, his example of, of the restraint. And, you know, here's probably a, a child or adult, if you think about psychiatric, uh, uh, a situation uh -huh. where they they've probably been re-traumatized in some way to have such an extreme behavior and then the intervention which we, we have to do to keep folks safe uh, again can be re-traumatizing on top of that and I, I know you've worked in these these settings too and just kind of I'd love to get your thinking again of someone who's who thinks a lot about structuring therapeutic communities uh, to, to create safety and, and then, you know, changing behavior. Sort of how does this uh, kind of science that's come out, I think uh, since both the, you and I were probably originally trained uh, on some of this stuff, how's that inform uh, your approaches as well? Mm. I'll think back to um, one of the, when I first became a, a clinician on a residential unit. And one of the first things that we started to notice is... I'm back. Hey, Jerry. <laughs> Jerry's more integrated. Something happened with my connection, right? You got disintegrated. I got disintegrated. <laughs> <laughs> I had a repressed memory of you. For a while, you weren't there. And now you're back. I hope it wasn't a scary memory. It, it, it was good. It was good. So you Kurt's telling us about, about some of his things. And you were smiling, so it was good. Yes. So, so does that all make sense? I, yeah, I think it does. And I, and I asked Kurt to kind of think about that. Like when, when he thinks about, I know he does a lot about structuring uh, places as well. And, and to get some of his thoughts about uh, how this all relates to his approach too. One of the things that I've noticed over the years um, with kind of behavior management systems, um, which in, 
from a design standpoint, the, the premise of them is very good in that you want to have a, a, a system or a structured way to make sure that there are a high frequency of positive repetitive events. Right? That's the underlying driver of that. That often gets miscommunicated and misconstrued, right? So we often go quickly to um, kind of a, a consequence driven or if you do this, then you lose this kind of approach. Right? And that's when it starts to really slip on you. And so that's where you really got to have some caution. Not that you should never do that, right? Connecting behavior with what, but with both positive and sometimes negative consequences is an important part of learning. And if you can't operate with that, then you've got a problem functioning in the world. So it's, I'm not saying that we should completely do away with all of that thing. Although I would say it's probably, it'll, it'll rear its head on you. So <laughs> If you just focus on making sure that there are enough positive repetitive events, there will be enough consequences that will happen. All right, so it will, it will come up. Um, so we started noticing, this was, oh geez, eight years ago probably. And what would, what would happen is we, we would have this kind of program, right? We had levels in it. Right? And we could have all kinds of arguments about whether we should have levels and all that kind of stuff. The problem with it was that the way that it was designed, kids would come to the program and you had to earn your way up levels, right? And that became really problematic because what it did is it set it up so that when that person came to your environment as a new member of your culture, it was not welcoming, which is I think what Jerry was describing, right? Let's talk about how we understand and incorporate your needs into what our, into what our culture is. How do we welcome you in a way that makes you feel safe and secure and we get an understanding of what those things are that make you feel safe and secure so that was an important shift that we started to make and it was as sometimes it can be so simple right it start it was as simple as walking onto the unit and there would be a new new kid who was admitted to the unit and one of the things i started doing to model this for our staff is to walk right up to that kid make a big smile and and welcome them and say we're so glad that you're here like little things like that and they go can you help me to understand like you engage in a conversation like what well, i know it's kind of hard to come into a new place and uh, tell me what that's like and how can we make it so that you feel comfortable and how can we kind of get you connected to all of the other kids who are here how can we make you uh, comfortable so that you can get to know people know where to go when you have needs that need to get met and who do you go ask so when you need something how do how do you get that need met and we started shifting the way that we welcomed new people into our culture and we did the same thing with staff, right? It, that, that kind of earn your way up mentality, it also was true with our new staff who would come and work on the unit, right? You had to earn your stripes, right? To be able to be integrated into the culture. And that started, that was really quite problematic as well. So we had to turn that whole thing around. And it really, it, it, it was tied a lot to the questions that we asked and making sure that we asked very quickly what is it that you need? What can we do to be helpful? How can, like, how can we understand what your needs are and help you to know how to navigate and get around and get your needs met within this environment? And those things were, were hugely important. Yeah. We started doing one thing was one of my favorites. Um, we started, this is on an, an acute programming unit, and we started um, every, new, every kid who came in, we would offer them a stuffed animal and a blanket every single time they could take it over there or, or not or, or not take it right and of course most of the older kids did not want one some of them wanted it but didn't want everybody to know that they had it, it but we always had something there that was tangible to offer i'd say can we give you a, a stuffed animal which one would you like or would you like a, a blanket which one would you like um so those little things like that are 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 they're concrete ways to get to kind of the ideal that Jerry, you were describing of how do we engage with people in, in these kind of more meaningful ways and structuring it really, it, it makes a big difference. I mean, our, we would look at after we did that stuffed animal blanket, um, I call that an intervention, right? <laughs> For our program. Um, it started to really meaningfully reduce the number of times that we actually had to place hands on a child within the first 72 hours. Mm -hmm. And being able to reduce that number in the first 72 hours changed the pathway of that whole admission.
Yeah. It, it not having not having to have that experience the first, within the first few hours that you're in this new environment changed the way that that environment went over the course of that entire admission. Yeah. The little thing, the, the great thing is that you can make small changes and they can have big impacts on larger, uh, a larger kind of system and, and organization wide things. So um, those were really fun ones that, that popped into my head as, as I was listening to Jerry. Very cool. One of the things that, that I, you know, and it sounds like an incredibly simple suggestion, but it was, uh, came out actually, she was a guest on our show. show uh, I know Jerry and I's uh, friend, uh, Olga, uh, Dr. Vera. And one of the things that uh, I asked her at one point is, is, is she's a, a EMDR therapist, which deals with you know, a lot of sort of taking the power away from memories. Because another interesting thing about memory is if you can recall it, a memory that would elicit a post-traumatic stress disorder response or re-traumatization response, that high level of anxiety, if we can get folks, create psychological safety, give them coping skills, really get them in a relaxed state, to recall that memory, it, de it destabilizes the memory because every time we tell a story, the story might change when it gets locked back into memories. But recalling that memory in that calm, supportive environment when it locks back in, it takes a little bit of the power away. And there's some, so there's some really amazing stuff on the treatment side, which I know we don't have time to really get into. But one of the, the questions I asked her uh, was, how, how, how many hours does it take for someone with a complex or compound trauma or repeated traumatic experiences to build the level of safety and coping skills needed to start the, the work on the memory part? And she says with a lot of folks, it's up to eight, eight sessions or eight hours. And I think to me, that's always stuck with me because so often um, we will jump into asking potentially re-traumatizing uh, questions right off the bat. Uh, you know, medical providers, again, they may only have maybe one meeting with the folks before they're laying hands on not knowing if the area they're examining uh, could potentially be re-traumatizing to folks. So, you know, sometimes all this complexity for me, uh, one of the big suggestions I have for folks, and I think it, it kind of embodies, I think you guys added to this quite a bit in both your answers, but is to slow down. Um, I think when we get rushed, uh, and, and I think our systems promote this, it's not medical providers' fault uh, that they only have 15 minutes at a time to, to see somebody. It's not uh, necessarily my fault in residential, Jerry, and I know we had to, like one of our outcomes was measured, do we get the kid out in 90 days? Not are they more mentally healthy, not did they heal, but yeah, just that they're out uh, in 90 days. And and I think if we, if we can find areas where we can slow down and I think ask some of these questions is, you know, Jerry, I think, I think your thing about, you know, you know, some of the things I might say might feel uncomfortable to you. And, and I want to make sure you're safe to, to say those back to me and trying to, trying to build a little bit of that empowerment that, that uh, sort of uh, giving them permission to stop the process um, little things like that, I think, have huge outcomes because if you come to me as a service provider, at least in an outpatient way where you can't run away um, or you could run away, um, then a, one negative experience might lose you to care um, and there's tremendous consequences to that. So I think this slowing down, this acknowledging this are, are, are little things, but they can have huge impacts on, on folks with, with a lot of that trauma in their background. You know, Matt, you, you raise this issue often, and it's a very valid issue, is that we, we are striving to have a trauma-informed system, right? And in, in a way, the system is not designed to be trauma-informed, right? It's, it's not designed. And so people who, for example, if I were to design, redesign the system, that our responses to individuals who there's neglect and abuse going on in the house, the last thing I'd want to be doing is bringing in the police and bringing in child protection is people who aren't really trained to do that, right? I would be training them differently in order to how to respond to those situations. And so 
we somehow, a physician, in a way, isn't really, they're, they're in there and they're this blank screen, they're coming in and asking questions, and this person is interpreting it through their experience. And what we're really trying to do is change everybody along the line to be able to do that, which is in some ways um, a great North Star goal, but incredibly challenging. So you, you, know, you look at residential, the, the individuals who really have this knowledge are very different than the people delivering the caring on a day-to-day -day basis. The people who are responding as quickly as they can to a child protection issue, um, really they don't have this knowledge. They're, they're knowledgeable about uh, child protection issues and what determines can this kid be removed, can this, uh, so that we're, we're in a process of disseminating information across a system that's been designed on, on a long way. And, and we're far from, we're better than we were but we're far from where everybody is going to be asking these questions, right? That, that's, that's the truth. And so the, the thought really is how do we keep making progress as opposed to in some ways being over here? How do we begin to understand that really the, the, the mother who's neglectful is she never had an experience of being seen and heard and valued. So she has very little ability to do that for her child, right? So if our response is to respond to her in a way that doesn't see her and says, oh, we're here to just take care of your kid, that's a reenactment, right? And yet we have to jump in and make sure that child's safe. So the chat, I, I think what we really want to get to is that we're not doing things unconsciously, is that we are more mindful of how we're interacting. And so if a, a physician is working in a, in a capacity where they're going to have to, in some ways, do a, um, a physical, instead of saying, I wonder which one of my clients are traumatized, I build in practices that I deal with all people that way. Yeah. Right? I, I spend all people. I, if I'm a caseworker, if I'm a, if I'm a, you know, a, a, a child care worker, if I'm a residential staff, all people coming through the door have been in some ways an experience that's different than mine. That's just the way the brain works. So my job really is, is not just to do what I need to do, but to really understand how that is impacting them. So, you know, I think, as Kurt said, he went in, he changed his model of how we welcome people. But I can guarantee you go back to that same place he changed and they're doing the same thing they used to do because they're stressed and they're not thinking about it, right? And so it isn't, it, it really is, how do we get enough repetitions of doing the things we know work better so that it, they become automatic for, for us to kind of looking at that. Because ultimately, we're trying to get people not necessarily to get a house, to get, to get food, to get, we're trying to get people to feel safe in their own bodies. Yeah. That really, when I have an emotion, when I have, uh, I can manage what's coming up for me, whether it's internally or I can see people, that's the ultimate goal. And at, people who usually come to us for services, it's not about something that happened in the past. It's something that's happening in the present that's interfering with your ability to feel safe and secure managing to, to do it. So if we can think about how can I make this experience a validating safe interaction in the moment, that's really what we're striving to kind of get to. Yeah. And I think that's a great way to, to again, Jared, Jared, Jerry hit the high point to wrap up on there. And I, I think, you, you know, it also just shows the complexity of the work. And I, I always say, if you're, if we're regulated enough to sit back and, you know, ask the question, struggle with the dilemma, um, we usually come up with, with a relatively right answer, especially 
if we if we understand the the some of the basic concepts that we talk about every week on this podcast. Uh, that's why I love giving people a little bit of information like we, we got to do this week to, to a fairly large group. Because I think even on some of the basic information, you, you find the right questions to ask um, in a healthy work environment where, where we're re regulated. Um, and that's where I think the power of this really lies is, is uh, some information. I think, you know, there's a parallel process that we can help uh, our patients, students, clients with it as well with this. And I, I think that's the exciting thought part about being part of this uh, paradigm shift. Excellent. Well, Kurt, Jerry, thank you for another great conversation. Uh, as always, you can find, uh, we'll throw some discussion questions up, show notes and resources at uh, traumainformedlens.org. Uh, and uh, next week, uh, we're going to try to have a, a uh, uh, I'm going to be out of state, but trying to have, I think all three of us uh, chiming in. I've been doing some work in Pasadena, California with a great organization, Young and Healthy, who has really been taking on the task of creating uh, or, or developing Pasadena as a trauma-informed city. And so get to explore that concept uh, next week. So hope you join us. And uh, we'll see you soon. Everybody have a great week. Great. Thank you.